Well, good, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, the Voices Library Lecture Series. We would like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikanak or Mohegan people, who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohegan Nation. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors, past and present. Voices presents speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out and return the surveys that you were given upon entering the BTC Auditorium. These surveys will help to inform future presentations. Today, we are honored to present Sarah Donnelly and Kathleen Katie Weeks, both licensed mental health counselors from the HVCC Wellness Center. As counselors in the Wellness Center, Sarah and Katie offer counseling and wellness services that include providing short-term individual and crisis counseling with an integrated approach for currently enrolled students to facilitate their academic success and improved overall wellness, as, a, a, as well as providing wellness presentations and consultations for students, faculty, and staff. Sarah Donnelly, LMHC, earned her master's degree in counseling and community psychology from Sage Graduate School in 2009. Sarah began working at the Wellness Center, formerly known as the Center for Counseling and Transfer, in 2010. Katie Weeks, LMHC, earned her master's degree in mental health counseling from the University at Albany in 2015. Katie began working at the Wellness Center at Hudson Valley Community College in 2017. Thank you, and, and join me in welcoming our speakers today. So I'm Sarah Donnelly, and this is Katie Weeks, and we're going to be talking with you today about depression, anxiety, and resiliency amongst college students. We'll be discussing current statistical trends regarding student mental health with a specific focus on depression, anxiety, and psychological flourishing. During this presentation, you'll hear us talk about psychological flourishing. And when we are doing so, we're referring to resiliency. Uh, what to look out for regarding behaviors and symptoms associated with depression and anxiety. We'll be going over some basic criteria and symptoms associated with depression and anxiety. And we'll be highlighting what's in your folders, which covers various coping and self-care techniques. Uh, what works for one individual will not work for another, so there's, there's various to choose from. And lastly, we'll be talking about the counseling services that we do offer in the Wellness Center. Okay, guys, so like Sarah was just saying, we're going to get started with some quiz, quick statistics. We're not going to bore you too much with a whole bunch of different slides about them, but um, there are definitely some that are worth noting. So in the last um, academic year, so uh, academic year 2016-2017 to 2017-2018, we've seen a 75% increase in the amount of uh, utilization of our services on campus. So um, we've seen this huge increase in the amount of students that are coming to counseling services. Um, when we talk about different research and different studies that are being done um, all across different campuses in the United States, there is definitely um, a positive impact for students reaching out to counseling services. It not only helps with their retention, which just means staying in school, but it also helps their overall success. And when we're talking about student success, we're not only just talking about their academic success, we're talking about success in all the different areas of your life. Okay. Um, so one of the big contributors that we might be seeing um, this vast increase in the amount of utilization is the decrease in stigma um, around mental health. So what I mean by that is a lot of times um, in the past, mental health has had this negative um, outlook, right, or people have seen it in a negative light. You might still see it today in um, the news or different movies and things like that. But what's happening is that we're seeing a decrease in that stigma because we're seeing a lot of um, celebrities, actors, people in the public coming out and talking about their own mental health. Mental health in general is being talked about a lot more, um, which allows students to feel more comfortable in accessing our services. So not only are we seeing here at Hudson Valley a 75% increase, but nationwide across college campuses, we're seeing a 3% increase in the utiliz utilization of services. 
So the next couple of slides are going to be some quick graphs. This is really going to illustrate the, the differences in what we're seeing in presenting concerns. So like Sarah was saying, we're really going to focus on depression, anxiety, and resiliency today. So the first graph is depression. So as you can see, the last, uh, the last several years here, 2015 to 2018, we're seeing a 12% increase um, in students coming in with the presenting concern of depression. So more and more students are coming in saying that they are depressed or that they have symptoms related to depression. Likewise, with anxiety, we're seeing a 10% increase from 2016 to 2018. And again, this is nationwide, so we're seeing more and more students come in with both anxiety and depression as their presenting concerns. What do you think are some common things that Hudson Valley students might face that might lead to not only the increase in utilization of services, but increase in depression and anxiety? Tests and homework. Tests and homework, what do you mean by that? Pressure to succeed, absolutely, that's a big one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, so the workload, how different is it from high school to college, right? Yeah, so not only do you have a lot more free time and time to kind of structure on your own, but for every, what is it, I think it's every hour you're in class, you're supposed to spend three hours with homework or studying. Have you guys heard that before? It's pretty intense, right? So if you're spending 15 credit hours in class, 45 hours outside of class they want you to be doing a week. It's a full-time job, right? Hand up over here. Yeah, because this is only college, so it's hard to find a relationship between work and study. Sure, yeah, so finding that balance. Yeah, absolutely. So community college, it's a commuter school, right? We don't have um, dorms right on campus, so spending that time between work, a lot of students are working um, or have other responsibilities outside of school as well, certainly. Finances, that's a huge one. Absolutely. How do we find that balance, right? That's why a lot of us are working as well as going to school. Thank you. Any others? Yeah. Children. children? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Children. Yeah. So different students that have children or different siblings that they're caring for or even parents or loved ones that they have to care for as well. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. So all of those things you mentioned and a lot more different reasons why we're seeing that increase in utilization of our services and students coming in with those symptoms of depression, those symptoms of anxiety, just that general feeling of overwhelm. So it comes along with that, right? So we're seeing the increase in all of these negative symptoms of mental health. We're seeing a decrease in psychological flourishing. So as Sarah mentioned, when we talk about psychological flourishing, we're really talking about resiliency. So when we talk about resiliency, we're really talking about that ability to kind of um, come back from some stressor or adversity, right? Come back in a quick manner. So psychological flourishing is a state where people experience those positive emotions, positive psychological functioning, and positive social functioning the majority of the time. So what, as you guys can see on this graph, that continues to decrease. So as these different um, symptoms of anxiety, depression, mental health are increasing, our psychological flourishing is decreasing, right? So that means our, our ability to be more resilient and overcome these daily stressors is starting to decrease as well. Uh, behaviors and symptoms of depression and or anxiety can um, um, significantly impair functioning, not only academically, but in all areas of one's life. Um, some of these behaviors and symptoms are more extreme than others. For example, um, strange and bizarre behavior indicating a loss of contact with reality um, and compared with difficulty focusing um, or having trouble keeping up with a course workload um, or lack of motivation, decreased energy levels. Um, and each student may present differently. Um, they may not say, you know, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. Um, so what we are seeing maybe, for example, a lack of motivation um, may present uh, or manifest as, um, as depression. So the purpose of this presentation is really to, to skim the surface, surface regarding depression and anxiety and provide a general information of what you may commonly see. Um, and there are various levels of depression. Depression can uh, present differently from person to person. Um, depression is a mood disorder causing significant impairment in daily life, characterized by the following symptoms, um, lasting at least two weeks or more. 
Um, and so depressed mood, um, loss of interest, uh, significant weight loss, sleep difficulties, fatigue, and um, there are lots of words describing this um, tree, um, which is characterized for depression, breakdown, miserable stress, despair, hopelessness, frustration, um, anger, um, and that really illustrates the complexity of the diagnosis of depression. And you'll see anxiety is on here because anxiety and depression often go hand in hand. So as we continue to talk about depression, we want to talk a little bit more about um, some of the demographics and risks for depression. So women are two times more likely to develop depression. And depression is one of the most common mental health diagnoses in the United States today. So about one in every 10 people will experience depression during their lifetime. Now, when we talk about this, the majority of people are going to experience that first depressive episode between ages 20 and 30, right? So right around um, our traditional age um, college student, right? What's happening during your late teens, early 20s? You're becoming an adult. Like yeah, you're becoming an adult. You have to pay bills, a whole bunch of different responsibilities that come along with that. Anything else? Yeah, you're planning for your future, right? We're graduating high school at 16, 17, 18 year old, years old, and they're like, hey, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? You're like, uh, I'm not sure, right? Trying to figure it out. Some of us might know from the time that we're two years old what we want to do. Others might take three different career choices in their lives, right? Because we're, we're still trying to figure that out. So it's a huge stage of um, development and figuring those different things out. Absolutely. Um, Risks for depression include family history of depression or different similar disorders. There's also going to be um, socioeconomic status, uh, unemployment, social isolation, or other different stressful or traumatic experiences in our lives, and regular drug and alcohol use. And different um, medications or physical illnesses can also contribute to depression as well. Okay? Um, so again, depression is going to look different for each and every person. Right? If everyone in this room had depression, we might all be expressing it differently. We might see some of the more, um, when we think of depression, what do you guys typically think of? What might it look like? Sad. Withdrawn. Can't get out of bed. Anything else? Good, so those are the top three things that people typically say, right? Sad, withdrawn, can't get out of bed, not motivated to do a lot of different things, all the things that Sarah was just really talking about, right? So, again, these are different things that are going to be more common for people of depression, but there's also different people who might be captain of the football team, right? Or they might be a student body president and they have depression. They might be a stand-up com uh, comedian and have depression, but you wouldn't know it just by looking at them. So what we're trying to also convey here is what we're, we're kind of doing the broad brushstrokes of these different diagnoses, but again, they're so varied from person to person that it's important that you kind of check in on some of these things and what that looks like for you. So how to recognize anxiety in yourself and others. Um, this illustration, um, uncontrollable worry, excessive nervousness, uh, problems with sleep, muscle tension, um, poor concentration, Increased heart rate, um, having an upset stomach, um, avoidance, avoidance is a big one um, from fear. And in small doses, anxiety can be very helpful. Um, a certain amount of anxiety is normal, especially when you're a college student. It kind of forces to get your, your coursework done. Um, and it protects us from danger and just helps us focus overall. Um, but when anxiety is too severe, it and it occurs too frequently, it can really become debilitating. So there's this, you may have heard of a, the fight, flight, or freeze response um, to a perceived threat. And this can be an often very intense, instinctual reaction. So we are going to be doing a little exercise. And we're going to be calling 10 of the audience members up at, at random, you know, completely random. All right? No, no, we're not going to do that. No, 
we're not going <laughs> to do that to you. We don't like being put on the spot. I would, we would never do that to, to anyone. Um, but um, by a show of hands, who, when I said that, immediately thought like, okay, you know, um, a little uncomfortable, but I can, I can roll with this. If I'm, if I'm picked, it might be fun. Okay, okay. So that would be the fight response. You may feel a little uncomfortable, but you know, hey, I'll give it a try, right? So by a show of hands, who um, had an immediate reaction that you needed to run to the bathroom or take, pretend to take or make an important call? It's okay, be honest. Yes, that, that would be me. That's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> I would do that. Um, okay, and, and how many of you kind of just, and that would be the, the flight, um, and how many of you were just kind of like, oh gosh, what's going on? Maybe, maybe I won't be picked, I'll just, I'll just sit here and, okay, okay. So that would be more of the freeze kind of, we'll just sit and wait, what, see what happens, okay. Um, so that is just an example of what, you know, a quick kind of anxiety response. You may have noticed yourself being like, whoa, I didn't sign up for this. A little bit of, right? Um, right? So um, now, and just, uh, there, there, are there are all different types of reactions to anxiety. Um, just as there are different types of anxiety. So there's generalized excessive anxiety or worry. Phobias, an intense um, specific fear of a situation or an object. Um, and then there's panic, extreme anxious response where the person experiences a panic attack um, by numerous um, physical symptoms and, and an overall feeling of dread. Now, when one um, is adjusting one's life and avoiding anxiety provoking situations on a consistent basis, then we'll move, it moves into the, the cycle of anxiety. How anxiety grows and develops. So anxiety drives people to avoid things or situations that may overwhelm them or make them feel uncomfortable. When a scary thing or situation occurs um, and it, it, it's avoided, um, there's an immediate short-lived sense of relief because you're out of the situation. Um, however, the next time a similar threat arises, uh, it might feel even more overwhelming, and this creates a harmful cycle of avoidance and worsening anxiety. So the anxiety, the avoidance, the short-term relief of the anxiety, and then over time, the long-term um, growth of anxiety. So now that we've talked about anxiety and depression, we're going to talk, talk a little bit about resiliency. So again, like I mentioned earlier, resiliency is really just the, our capacity to recover from adversity or a stressor, right? When we talk about resiliency and we're being resilient individuals, it's something where this is an active, healthy process, okay? So we're doing different things to make sure we're taking care of ourselves so that we're not getting to that feeling of overwhelm um, or stress. What might that look like if we're looking and acting resilient? Okay, so feeling like you're getting behind on a class, you have a study session, great. Anything else? Who's heard of the term self-care? <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, that's a buzzword. I hear it all the time, right? <laughs> so only a handful of you. Well, fantastic. You're going to hear all about it in a few minutes. Um, so we're engaging in different self-care activities. Again, when we are feeling that stress, it's not something that sends us um, kind of over the edge. We're completely overwhelmed where we feel like we can't accomplish anything. We almost see it as a motivating factor in terms of, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to figure out what I need to do to take care of how I'm feeling, right? Um, how might it feel or act or how might we be acting if we aren't resilient? Sleep a lot? Not facing reality. Can you explain that a little bit more? Um, you're hoping things will go away. Sure. But you're making no effort to make a change. Yeah, absolutely. So kind of wishing it away and saying, well, I hope something changes, but we're not actively doing anything about it. Good. Anything else? 
We might start to feel anxious, might start to feel depressed, stressed, overwhelmed. Those are the different things that we're going to feel if we're feeling, um, if we're having a lack of resiliency, rather. So the interesting thing with resiliency is a lot of times it can almost mirror some of the different um, symptoms that we might be experiencing with, say, anxiety and depression. So for example, if one of our self-care activities is to kind of um, take some time to ourselves, um, kind of reflect on our thoughts and feelings, different things like that, just kind of do some solitary activities. Someone who's depressed, you guys mentioned before, they might isolate, they might withdraw, they might not be showing up to class or having difficulty getting out of bed. So to an outside person, they might be looking like they're doing the same things. What's the difference? The effect of what they're doing, absolutely, right? So we're looking at the purpose of the activity. So when someone's resilient and they're doing different self-care activities and they're taking time to themselves and they're engaging in kind of those solitary activities to recharge and recuperate, they're doing that active, healthy process to, to decrease their stress, right? Versus if we're feeling depressed and we're withdrawing, we're not socializing with our friends, we're having difficulty getting out of bed, that depression, that stress is something that's being overwhelming for us, right? It's making it difficult for us to manage those different things. So those are unhealthy ways of coping. Good. So what are different ways that we can kind of check in on our own sense of resiliency? Um, so in your guys' folders, we have a self-care assessment. Um, now, this, this is something you can do more formally, like actually taking the assessment, or this is something that you can do kind of just as a mental check-in, right? So. As you notice, you're going to check one, two, or three, um, or put a star next to it, and say, I either do this poorly, I do this okay, or this is something that I do well. As you're going to notice with this self-care assessment, it's not just around psychological um, or emotional health. Okay? Our first one's actually talking about physical uh, self-care. So that includes your typical things that um, you probably heard throughout grade school, make sure you eat. Um, you know, the, what is the healthy plate, right? Balanced meals, eating regularly, different things like that. Making sure you're getting enough sleep, but also quality sleep. If you're sick, making sure you're taking your care of yourself um, and you're recuperating, different things like that. Exercising on a regular basis as you can. Then we get to that psychological or emotional self-care. So talking about our feelings, um, taking some time off, right? So that's why we have Thanksgiving break. That's why we have different breaks um, in school, even in middle school, elementary school, high school, different things like that. That's why we get vacation days, right, when we are in the workforce. So because it's healthy for us to take that time, okay? Um, so again, expressing our feelings in a healthy way, that could be through talking, creating art, journaling, different things like that. So taking care of our mental health in that sense. There's also social self-care. Anybody heard of social self-care before? A couple of us, good. So like we were saying, when we talk about our overall wellness, we're not just talking about physical or emotional self-care. We're gonna talk about social self-care. So meeting new people, spending time with people that not only we like, but we feel good when we're around them. Um, doing enjoyable activities with other people, trying something new, keeping touch with friends that are either here or maybe at another school. We're also gonna look at our spiritual self-care. So this can be if you're religious, um, praying or studying the Bible or um, whatever religion that you follow. You might be meditating, spending time in nature, doing different things where you're connecting with yourself, okay? The last one is professional self-care. Now, this relates to your career, but it also relates to your ability um, or your current role as a student. How do you think that is? Or why do you think that is? So remember when we talked about earlier, if you're taking 15 credits, you're expected to spend 45 hours doing homework and studying? That's full-time job, guys, okay? So in your current role, you want to do these different things. Being able to say no to excessive new responsibilities. Sorry, I can't plan that party. Or sorry, I can't um, lead this, this group when I'm already, you know, captain of the um, soccer team and I'm in the student senate and I've got my full caseload of classes, right? Oh, and I just got a puppy, okay? So different things like that. Making sure we're taking breaks, whether we're working or studying, and 
being comfortable in our workplace, right? So finding good places that you can um, be comfortable studying, different places that you can take a break and relax and kind of reconnect. So what can we do for ourselves, right? So some of this is going to sound maybe a little redundant, but we're going to develop our resiliency toolbox, okay? So the graphic on this side right here is basically just going over that self-care assessment, right? So exercising, reaching out to people, engaging in hobbies, um, doing different things that are comforting, right? So if summer is ending and you want to have that last more of the summer, or you're really excited about fall and you really want to have some hot chocolate, different things that are comforting for you that make you feel relaxed, doing different things like listening to music, um, being creative, whether that's being artistic, um, or di doing different things like that, exercising, meditating, all different types of coping skills that can help us build our resilience. So we talked about self-care, talked about different coping skills. In your uh, folders, you're also going to see a whole bunch of different relaxation techniques that can be really helpful as well. So, kind of as we talk about this, sometimes people are like, oh, it's kind of boring. I don't want to have to remind myself of that. I don't want to have to take a self-care assessment every time I want to check in with myself. How many people play bingo as a kid? Right? If not, go play bingo. It's fun. Um, so, we made a self-care bingo. Uh, or we borrowed it from someone, rather. Um, so, it's got different things on here that maybe we do on an everyday basis that we don't really pay attention to. Right? We kind of go on autopilot. Yeah, I shower every day, I get dressed, I do these different things. Um, but by doing this self-care bingo, we look at it from a different perspective. We allow it to say, okay, these are different things that allow me to take, it or take better care of myself. I'm giving back to myself. I'm doing different things that are healthy for me. So just by looking at it, how many people are close to a bingo already or already have one for today? Handful of you, okay? So again, like I said, maybe brush your teeth, um, tried something new, ate some good food, talked to a friend. Sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that we got shit done today, right? That can be pretty helpful. Um, so one that we're going to be able to cross off right now is we used a coping skill. We're going to do another exercise. So we're just going to play a five-minute guided meditation. Um, how many of you practice any, any type of meditation or, or coping? Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, so it does. It takes practice. Sometimes five minutes can, can seem much longer um, when, you're, when you're going through it. Um, so just check in with yourselves how you're feeling right now um, before this, this guided meditation. Um, get comfortable in your chair. Um, you can close your eyes if you like or, or keep them open. Um, being... Uh, conscious of of your breathing um, during this um, this uh, meditation um, it's instructing to put your hand on your solar plexus that's right here um, for those of that you those of that you don't know it is the, the pit of your stomach it's an essential part of the nervous system um, and preparing the body's um, stress response which I didn't know that I had to look it up so I, was, I we were kind of reviewing it and it's put your hand on your solar plexus can we show that video um, so <laughs> that's what it is this is an exercise in calming the breathing prior to meditation the aim here is to simply forget you are breathing, not to force it, but become unaware and relax completely, allowing yourself to listen to the meditation. It is important, first of all, to make yourself as comfortable as possible. If you are sitting up, there is no need to sit poker straight. And likewise, do not lean over to constrict your breathing. Find a position that will allow you to be comfortable for a few minutes. Begin 
this meditation by breathing as normal. For a little while, just allow your thoughts to come and go as they will. you have been breathing while your mind is skipping through the subjects in your head. Think about how the air moves in and out of your lungs. And now concentrate on where the air is entering your body, your nose or mouth. Each time you breathe in, Say in your mind the word, peace. When you exhale, imagine that you are exhaling your restlessness, the whirl of your many thoughts. Let it rest there. Imagine you are looking out of a window. A white feather floats in the air. It rises and falls with each breath you inhale and exhale in a gentle, soothing motion. Watch the feather and breathe with it until your breathing calms and becomes relaxed and effortless. So noticing how you were feeling before um, and how you were feeling after. Um, anyone have anything that they'd like to say about the experience? So, because it's just like in your um, in your folders. Um, so what works for one, what works what won't work, won't work for another. So some may really enjoy meditation and find it helpful, and others might might not and find it, I don't know, maybe even more anxiety provoking, who knows. Um, anyone want to share? Okay. <laughs> Yes, no, that's a very good point. Yes, it's hard. It's very difficult. It takes practice to quiet your mind um, and quiet those thoughts that like to keep um, intruding, right, when you're, when you're just trying to, to relax and focus on your breath and kind of, it's kind of like a preset, 
kind of presets you in a day. Thank you. All right, so if a student is still feeling um, overwhelmed, anxious, or depressed, um, our students can access our counseling and wellness services um, at the Wellness Center. Um, so we uh, focus on mental, emotional, behavioral, and interpersonal functioning um, so that you can affect, um, ac achieve academic success. Um, and this, all of this also is in a brochure in your, in your folder, all of this information. So our location and hours. Why see a counselor? For a number of reasons. Um, really, uh, family, relationship concerns, uh, difficulty concentrating, grief, managing stress, it's a big one. Um, problems with anger, um, anxiety, depression, that's what we were talking about today. Just feeling overwhelmed, um, really, just a, a gamut of, of what we um, see. Um, Sometimes, too, being able to go and talk to a counselor when things are going well mm -hmm. kind of seems um, counterintuitive, but what ends up happening when we spend some time reflecting on when things are going well, we feel the weight of those 10 times more. Right, so if things are going really well, okay, I'm, I'm really balancing my life well, I've been connecting well with friends, I'm doing well academically, I'm spending time with myself, um, spending time reaching out, doing all these different things. It's good to connect with someone because that way, when things are, are going well, we can figure out different ways to continue to do that, right? Um, which can, again, be just as impactful as going to a therapist to talk about, okay, why are things not going so well? Right, sometimes it's just helpful to talk with someone objective um, who doesn't know the inner workings of, of your life. Um, family, friends, um, significant others, that, that certainly has its, has its supportive place, but sometimes it just can be helpful to, um, to talk with someone, to process, to problem solve um, in, in that environment. Um, so what to expect from counseling? Um, generally, it's a short-term basis. On, um, it's contingent on a Hudson Valley student being a Hudson Valley student. Um, and by appointment, um, we take, do take walk-in and consultation sessions. Uh, we assist making referrals out into the community, and we also assist making referrals um, on campus, uh, you know, other re um, resources that a student could take advantage uh, on the campus community they may not be aware of. Confidentiality. Um, it's a free confidential service, um, and the only way confidentiality is breached is if, if a counselor feels that a student is in danger to him or herself or others, a suspected child abuse or neglect, or in legal cases if a clinician's records are subpoenaed. There's many benefits from counseling, um, improving communication, uh, greater self-acceptance, um, changing any maybe self-defeating behaviors or habits, um, relief from, as we were talking today, depression, anxiety, or other mental health conditions, um, increased confidence, decision-making, as I was talking about, you know, someone just sitting objectively, uh, if one has to make um, a stressful decision uh, or a problem-solving or having any um, Conflict, we work on conflict resolution abilities, and really just managing stress, managing stress effectively. So guys, as we start to kind of wrap up, again, we just kind of want to go over some of the things that we talked about today. So understanding those current mental health trends, we're seeing a lot more students utilize our services. Please come and see us. If you ever have a question, if it's right to come to us and ask or talk about something, come anyway. Like Sarah was saying, we do refer to other offices on campus or other services in the community if necessary, um, but we're always here to kind of talk with you and chat. We have both male and female counselors that are here um, Monday through Friday. Identifying those different behaviors and symptoms. Um, so like we talked about, we're seeing that increase in depression and anxiety, that decrease in resiliency. So Sarah touched on a lot of different symptoms and behaviors that are going to give you guys some insight. Hmm, maybe I need to do something about that. 
kind of touched on some different um, facts, criteria, different things like that with anxiety and depression. Um, we also talked about different things that you can do for yourself, right? Use that self-care bingo, use those different things, be creative, right? Figure out different things that you enjoy doing that help you relax and kind of recuperate when you're feeling stressed. The semester just started. Some of you might have come in feeling really stressed to begin with because, like some of you mentioned, this is a big transition from high school to college. Maybe you moved away from home. Um, Maybe you're here on your own and you haven't made friends yet or you don't have people from um, high school that you're familiar with. So there's a lot of different things that are transitioning right now. So do different things to make sure you're taking care of yourself, especially as the semester continues and things continue to ramp up with that. Um, and again, we're here, right? We're here to talk to you. We're here to help um, kind of guide you in the right direction for different resources and different things like that. So certainly come and, come and check us out. Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you guys so much Thank for coming. You. There is a question. Oh. Pause. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> thank you. So thank you guys so much. We appreciate everybody participating. There's one more comment slash question. So if the student is having a crisis right in your office um, and there's a concern for your safety, public safety would certainly be the, the office to call. But if it's something where a student um, maybe is just confided in you and, and there's some things that you feel like um, a counselor should talk to them about, you can certainly walk them over. Um, typically we have a counselor available. They might have to wait a minute or two or a few minutes until a counselor is available. But we certainly offer that. If anybody has an evening class and they're, um, there's a crisis or a friend is in crisis, contact public safety. Yeah, thank you, that was a great question. Could yeah. you remind everybody where you are, please? Absolutely, so um, everybody know where the Campus Center is? Yeah, so we're on the second floor of the Campus Center. If you're facing the cafeteria, we're on the right-hand side. That's where Health Services is as well. So it's called the Wellness Center. We have Health Services and Counseling Services. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good rest of your day.